Hello, and welcome to Education Table Talk here. Michael J., Educational Systemics, your host. And uh, really good to have everybody back. Um, got a lot of nice comments after the last show, and uh, we've moved to a new platform. We're now working with uh, Education t- uh, We're working with Blog Talk Radio, um, and uh, I think it'll allow you to get access to this much more easily um, online. I hope running loud, is it, Tila? Sorry, everybody, I'm having to compete with four violas here playing uh, idle. We'll fix this next time. It's a little loud. There we go. <laughs> so, um, you know, you just can never trust those violas, so uh, I'm a violinist <laughs> myself. Um, uh, this show today, uh, again, we thank our sponsor, MCH Strategic Data. Um, they're really a great partner to work with. Um, and they've been very, very supportive of the show, and we appreciate working with everybody over there. Um, and, uh, uh, again, find them a really great partner in all of this, and I think you will, too, if you work with them. Um, uh, today we have a show where we're going to be discussing, uh, really looking at one-to-one implementations. I was quite happy with what I thought was a reasonably clever title, because, I've had, you know, having done this now for as long as I have, I was surprised I haven't seen anybody pick up on that, which is the title of this is Betting on One-to-One Odds. Um, For those of you who are betting people or have a good background in probability, you'll know that those are not typically good odds to take. Um, But, in fact, it does represent that it's a win-win or a lose-lose proposition, depending on how you work with it. And the the subtitle for this this month's show is... um, is, uh, is I can't remember. Will one tablet, what is it, will one tablet solve our? Oh, that's <laughs> right. Will one tablet solve our educational headaches? I can't believe I I forgot. Um, so I think it's really yeah. There we go, everybody. Talk about breaking the ice. So um, it's really uh, uh, you know a question about looking at one to one. Is that really the solution? Um, is it uh, or is it a different problem altogether? So. We really have uh, three great guests today, and I, I just want to introduce the topic a little bit and say, you know, I, I've been doing one-to-one computing now for, this is my, this is my 30th year. Um, um, I started uh, at Apple, actually, as part of the Classroom of Tomorrow project um, in 1986, but before that was looking at one-to-one programs. And that program, the Classroom of Tomorrow project, or ACOT, was really a project to look at what happens when kids have ubiquitous access to technology. How do they use it? When do they use it? What do teachers do? How do you manage a classroom? And at that time, I mean, we had to give every kid two computers because there really was no portable computer. Um, So, uh, you know, we had kids with an Apple IIe at home and one in the school or some of the early Macs. And it was really interesting to see um, how students, uh, how the kids really gravitated towards the technology, how they used it, how it affected their personal lives. And there's really a nice bit of literature out there from the ACOT project about some of the changes that took place. Um, I, I think one of the keys, however, and I know we'll touch on that as part of today's show, is uh, one of the sites that I was primarily involved with was a site in Columbus, Ohio. And there we had teachers team teaching. We were doing social studies and language arts teacher were working together. Math and science teacher were working together. And it it was really, it it got acclaimed for being really a very, very progressive site. And yet we gave those teachers the afternoon to collaborate and work together. And, you know, although a lot of people pointed at the technology as being the point of of real innovation, I, I really think giving teachers time to work together, plan together, to really think outside of the box was a key component of that. So I think today we're certainly going to explore, you know, what does it mean to do one-to-one? Is one-to-one really the right solution? Um, And what comes with one-to-one? And on today's show, we really have um, some people who have experienced this from lots and lots of different perspectives. So I want to just have them uh, very quickly introduce themselves. Um, so uh, first I'll uh, say Eileen Lento, um, and I've gotten to know Eileen over the last few years, and um, Eileen's role is uh, in, in terms of driving a w- worldwide education globally um, around strategy. So Eileen, why don't you tell us, at Intel, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. So uh, like you, I've been uh, working on one-to-one efforts for quite some time, a, l- a little late start. 
Uh, I started in 87 at Northwestern, and during the 90s, you probably remember the urban systemics, the rural systemics, and the state systemics, and actually did work with Elliott back then in that capacity where we were uh, looking at one-to-one. And similarly, as you talked about, uh, it was a different definition of ubiquitous computing back then because it was pre-real mobility that like we have now. And uh, also like you, what we've seen, and even in the work I do at Intel now, is uh, teachers collaborating and being able to work together and solve these uh, challenges together, these transitions together, is absolutely critical to success. And, in fact, we go into pilot, we say you need at least two teachers that can work together. An isolated classroom is probably not a best practice. Yep. That's great. Thank you for that, Eileen, and thanks for being on the show. Uh, Let's go to you, David. David Engel. David Engel is a close personal friend, um, but somebody who has a a varied background, both uh, as a classroom teacher, a superintendent, a school principal, and in industry as well. So, David, give us a little bit about your background. Thanks, Michael. Um, Yeah, I've had a – I started in education in the 70s, so I got to uh, kind of integrate – technology and education very early in my career and have continued to puzzle my way through that, um, looking initially at school as the kind of unit of change and now as a superintendent looking at kind of the larger context in terms of both a district as, you know, the change ecology and and now working, uh, I've worked statewide and regionally with technology initiatives and have been in various districts um, in different guises, uh, including Seattle, where I was kind of I had oversight of 100 buildings, technology plans and planning. So I've had a you know kind of a from the school to uh, district-wide responsibilities around technology, and and I'm currently in a small district that's smaller than any of the high schools I was ever a principal of. So uh, the <laughs> technology projects here are interesting and have and involved uh, with our vision of education. That's great. Well, thanks, David. I know we'll hear more about some of those programs and how they fit with one-to-one. Um, and so last but certainly not least, Elliot, Elliot Soloway. Elliot um, I've known for many, many years, um, and uh, Elliot and I have, uh, what did we do that, for seven years plus, Elliot? We did yep. a yep. Um, LOL at ISTE, um, or NEC as it used to be, doing <laughs> humor in education and try to add another perspective to that. So, uh uh, I've seen Elliot, the good, bad, and the indifferent. So, Elliot, tell us about you a little bit. <laughs> Certainly. Hi, folks. Thank you very much for having me on. Uh, I used to, I started in artificial intelligence uh, when I was at Yale, and then we had a, a little kid, boy, and, and it dawned on me one day that making kids smarter would be a much better use of my time than making computers smarter. So I just stopped. I literally stopped that day doing artificial intelligence, thinking, oh, my God, it must be easier to build uh, programs for kids to learn. Yeah, right, right. Well, fast <laughs> forward, and I, <laughs> right, I would love to agree uh, with what, what uh, Eileen just said about the teachers and about what you just said about teacher time to prepare, and I'm sure we'll get more into that because that's what we're seeing. My colleague and I, Kathy Norris, we started with the handhelds. We Back when the Palm Pilot first came out, we said, this is it. Every kid can have one of these. It's low cost. It fits in their hand. It's cool. And, again, I literally stopped doing all the desktops and all the, the laptops and, and the heck with all that stuff. It, it's always going gonna, gonna to be on that little guy and that little jobber. Now, people thought we were pretty crazy. In 2010, we made a prediction that by 2015, every kid in every grade in every school would have one. And, you know, it's going to happen. That's who I am. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not the end of what we're going to hear from Elliot, I can tell you that. So uh, those are our three guests. Um, and uh, again, really excited, always excited about the show, but I think I'm um, really excited about this group. But now we're going to move to our next segment. We've heard from many of you that this is one of your favorite segments. Um, it's called You Can't Handle the Truth. So we're going to get started with this. As you know, um, in this segment, we'll read you three rumors. We, meaning this team, will read you three rumors, only one of which is actually true. And they all have to do with the topic of discussion today around one to one computing. So we're going to go ahead and get started. What you're going to do is listen to this, and then you can tweet us um, uh, what you uh, think is the actual correct 
um, answer, the first, second, or third, and I'll read that at the end, and, and I'll also give you our our Twitter handle um, as part of that as well. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. We're going to start with you, Eileen, with the one-to-one -one twist. Go ahead and read your rumor. Okay. Generally, one-to-one -one is the ideal ratio, or so suggests the saying, did you bring enough for everyone? However, some schools aren't buying into the computer side of one-to-one -one initiatives. At a Waldorf school in Sanu, California, near Silicon Valley, they decided to build on their own philosophy of experiential learning and take a different approach to one-to-one. -to -one. Well, the parents who bought into the Waldorf Indication philosophy believe that their children should be getting a mix of computer skills as part of their learning experiences at the Waldorf School facility. They were torn. They knew their students were getting plenty of computer exposure outside of school. To blend both ideas, they changed one, to one part of one-to-one, -one, the computers. By placing students in learning pairs, they taught students the best of one-to-one -one without introducing technology. One teacher, Mrs. Stafford says, by pairing students, we have created a one-to-one -one experience where students learn to communicate and collaborate as they make sense of the world around them. While we encourage collaboration among all students, the interreliance and trust in one another built through these pairs prepares students to rely on one another for point and counterpoint discussion rather than looking for the right answer somewhere on the Internet. So far, parents have bought into it, and the kids simply see it as another day with their friends. Thanks for reading that, Eileen. So here we have a Waldorf school that is doing what Waldorf schools do through experiential learning and taking a whole different approach to one-to-one, -to -one, um, and we call that the one-to-one -one twist. So thanks again, Eileen. Elliot, let's go to you next, um, reading us the rumor, sometimes you get more than you pay for. Thank you. While many communities want to implement one-to-one -one programs, many cannot find the funding for the upfront costs associated with a one-to-one -one initiative. One teacher at Clovis Elementary in New Mexico began to think differently about the role of technology in education. Mr. Salkin says that, quote, technology is a tool, and we have lots of technology around this community. Sometimes you need a computer, and sometimes you need a hammer. When you need a specific tool, the other just won't do the job. So Mr. Salkin proceeded to gather discarded, yet safe, technologies for use as part of a renewed commitment to hands-on, minds-on learning. Gathered from parents and the community, he accumulated a full set of standard tools, an oscilloscope, various gauges, paper manuals, some old digital cameras, ladders, fabric, plumbing discards, and even a few computers, to name only a few of the hundreds of objects he received. One-to-one -one is nothing over the rich learning environment I'm able to provide for my students, Mr. Salkin said. My fifth-grade students can apply what they learn with what they find around them using their math, language arts, and science skills with a social science context and even have time for arts. One of the students in his class says, we, have, we use a lot of what we learn in class even when we play outside of school. Now, there is novelty. Well, thank you so much for that, Elliot. Um, there's a, a teacher who really takes to heart the idea of hands-on and uh, engaging and, and believes that technology should be a multiple to one and uh, has a much broader view of technology. So that's sometimes you pay for, uh, you get more than you pay for. So thanks for reading that, Elliot. And lastly, uh, we'll turn to David Engel, reading Ready or Not. So I get the international rumor. A one-to-one -one implementation doesn't end when students are provided with technology. In fact, it just gets started. In a 2013 master's thesis exploring teacher attitudes towards integrating technology, the researcher looked at educators in both the U.S. and Saudi Arabia. The researcher identified that the U.S. has spent an incredible amount, over $70 billion, between 1993 and 2004 on technology. Despite having started a bit later, Saudi Arabia has nearly limitless resources to provide technology for their schools, teachers, and students. In discussions with teachers, however, some common threads emerged. One such issue was that teachers are afraid of navigating through technology and potentially failing. Quote. Another is that we, they have a huge amount of information they are required to teach, and they need to apply many standards or educational strategies at the same time, quote, and technology adds another complexity to the process. While both see the promise of technology and use it to increase their own productivity, when asked about the need to use technology in supporting student learning, the U.S. teachers generally agreed, whereas the Saudi teachers thought that they didn't need to use technology 
to be effective in working with students. Where they all agreed was that they need more professional development and time to plan to make efficient use of technology as part of their students' learning. Some things are just true regardless of where you are in school. Perfect. Thank you so much for that, David. So that was what we call ready or not. Uh, again, looking at U.S. teachers versus teachers in Saudi Arabia, and uh, looking at their uh, perception in terms of uh, in terms of technology. So. Um, we're going to come back to this towards the end of the show, and we'll have a little discussion among our, uh, among our uh, participants, and uh, we want to hear from you at uh, hashtag ETTFEB, E-T-T-F-E-B. Let us know which ones you think, or which one, one you think, is the correct uh, rumor. Again, the rumors are one-to-one uh, -one twist, sometimes you get more than you pay for, or ready or not. Let us know what you think. So we're going to jump right into the topic now, the topic of looking at one-to-one. -one. Um, we've already started that conversation through some of the introductions. Um, let's, like, what I want to do is open the conversation about, you know, what, what are the expectations we should have out of simply giving a computer to every child in a school? Um, anybody want to jump in and share? Sure, I'll jump in, Michael, just <clears throat> to get started yeah, here. Yeah, please, um, go. What I've learned about one-to-one -one is you need to have a pretty robust learning vision, uh, whether it's a building level or district level vision, to, to uh, be kind of the organizing uh, meme in the, in the work ahead. So for me, that's been really important um, to put out in front of people and to, to kind of develop some ownership around. Uh, yeah. Elliot, Eileen? Uh, so piling on there, uh, completely agree and the way I like to think about it is it's it's really a systems changed it's not actually about the device it's about what you do with the device and if you don't have a good vision and a good plan to know what success would look like uh, it, there's a chance you'll be disappointed well it, how uh, Elliot what do you think on that Elliot's in Paris. Can you hear us, Elliot? Just no, no yes, problem. Yes, problem with Elliot. Yes, I can. Uh, I had my mic muted. I was, I was worried. I was worried. Uh, I agree with with everything the folks are saying. The issue is we know that it takes more than just boxes. We know. But yet, when you read in the, in the, in the, the districts, 600,000, 2,500, 2,500, they buy boxes and they just put them out there. We know that doesn't work. And it's so frustrating. It's so frustrating. We could have predicted Los Angeles failure from day one. Actually, everybody did. But what are we going to do about this, folks? I think that's the issue. How do we get what we know out there? Yeah, I agree. I, I think uh, I'm in a really interesting place right now because I inherited a district that had a 10-year lapse in terms of any technology implementation here. And so I've been able to kind of watch what works and doesn't work and not make the same mistakes all over again. And what I'm learning is uh, to, to, to let the learning vision and the system change drive the tool set that goes out into that context. And so we're, we're making much more judicious sorts of purchases around devices. And um, Elliot's absolutely right. The device mentality of just driving devices out into a system is a catastrophe almost every time it's happened. <laughs> it, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Oh, every time. Sorry, Elise. No, and I would say it's it's a worldwide phenomenon. This is not just North America, although the examples we touched on were. And uh, it, but I I am feeling optimistic in that when you see some of the new RFPs coming out in the U.S., they are looking. The the request isn't so completely device-centric as they had been in the past, and they are looking more holistically at what are the essential ingredients for transformation. So I, I am optimistic that the transition in thinking to think more systemically is happening or starting to happen. 
Eileen, you know, you, you do with Intel, and uh, you have this wonderful classmate uh, machine that a lot of countries around the world have, have used. How are you, as long as we're talking about international, how are you seeing the transformation there? Because they're buying big box units, I mean, lots of them. Yes, but there's still people, and change is hard. Uh, they are. And, and remember, in, in many cases, when you're looking at different parts of the world, access is so the need for access is so primary that there really are there's a continuum of conversation here that's appropriate and how the world looks depends on where you're sitting and so understanding the uniqueness of where you are when you're looking at the challenges in some cases access is a huge step forward and uh and so you have to have the appropriate conversation in the context so systems change when you're struggling with electricity and water is very different than systems change in L.A. And Eileen, that's a great point. I, I was just thinking about the, the access piece in terms of what I've learned here in Port Townsend is um, access to broadband is not a trivial issue. And then the back office sort of what kind of infrastructure do you have to deliver out to your device ecology is is a whole other conversation. And and it's often invisible to people that, that that's a real struggle for lots of school districts wow. and school oh, systems. Absolutely. absolutely. We have a, you know, in the U.S., we're having a one-size-doesn't-fit-all conversation. <laughs> but the parameters of that conversation are actually fairly narrow when you think about global challenges. Yeah, I agree. We, we've been doing, uh, in Singapore, uh, Kathy Norris and I, we work at a Nanshaw Primary School, and the issue of access, uh, Internet access at the school is it really, oh, you're exactly right, David, is a challenge. But we're also trying to do 24-7 because learning isn't anytime, anywhere. Learning is all the time, everywhere. And so every way. You have the mo- every way. And when you have the b- devices, you can, you can learn every way with those devices. And it's mobile. And then how do you provide this con- continuity of access so it's one to one circa you know 2010 maybe is classroom based but now at the mobile it changes everything again it, yeah you know it, the, you raised a point um, that I wanted to make is that one to one projects are not drag and drop sort of programs no. and, <laughs> and and people have to recognize that they're going to be idiosyncratic um in terms of their development, so that you know, there's a starting template, but it's going to go places that the learners should drive. And I think that's thinking that's not common in, in at least the world I live in. Yeah, I, I think even uh, perhaps for lack of a better term, one to one. In in most of these mature markets, these kids are ten to one. You know, they got all sorts of devices in their pocket. And, yeah. and and thinking about that in terms of a building, I mean, we've all been to a convention center where each one of us is carrying four devices and we bring the network to its knees. Schools are yeah. having the same challenges. Absolutely. We just did and a, they don't understand. Uh, on our, on our uh, broadband provision, we, we basically have averaged out that students have three devices um, in their pockets. They have a tablet, they have a phone, and then they have the school-issued computer, and uh, the requirements for that are very different than what we engineered for. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And the costs are sincere, right? I mean, we underestimate those costs of networking if we're really, if we're really going to do this right with these multiple devices. So one-to-one, in some sense, is a misnomer. Right. And, and, and yeah. Elliot, you... Those are the good old days. Topic. <laughs> yes, yes. It's simple. It was simple then. Yeah, and, and you're poking at another topic, which is total cost of ownership and the value on your investment. And uh, often not a conversation I hear being addressed proactively. Uh, there, there is, particularly when you're talking about the networks and uh, what you need to support, uh, having that kind of proactive conversation ahead of time, critical. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we, we did... Um, yeah. We did a, a total cost of ownership study with some school districts implementing different technologies. And it's amazing how a lot of that data is just not even there. It's not part of the culture to think about 
TCO, and it's, it gets sort of buried in that process. I do want to just interrupt the conversation for a moment to tell everybody you're listening to Education um, Table Talk, um, put on by Educational Systemics, our sponsor, MCH Strategic Data. And uh, we're here today with, uh, with Eileen Lento and with Elliot Soloway and David, uh, and, and David Engel um, discussing the issue of one-to-one. Um, uh, why don't we take a, a quick break from the conversation? We're going to keep discussing this, um, looking at you know some trends in in the industry and adoption. But what I'd like to do is take us to really uh, look at one of the ways that we, um, other than they get the pleasure of getting to meet each other and a chance to be on the call, um, we also uh, uh, support them, uh, our guests. Um, not by paying them money, but in fact by supporting a project of, that's of interest to them. Um, and this is, uh, we're going to discuss a little bit about their Donors Choose project that they selected. Um, we donate in their name $50 towards a project of their selection. So um, what I'd like to do is just uh, uh, give them a chance to say something about their selection. Um, let's start out with uh, Elliot. You have uh, MakerBot Makes Our Classroom. Can you tell us a little bit about that and why you selected that project? I think the MakerBot movement is uh, at, the, at the edge. It really says when you learn, you learn by building, learn by doing. It's constructivism, social constructivism from a theoretical perspective. And I, I, I like the idea of supporting them they need it because they're buying lots of physical things, not just computers, lots of physical things. So I felt that it was important to support a project that – it's a model project. We, most classrooms, or many of them, will never be a maker bot kind of world, but we need them because mm -hmm. it's a good vision. People need to see what that vision is like. Well, and let's let's come back to that actually when we st restart the conversation about the role of the educator in a classroom that has that kind of maker bot mentality. Um, so we'll come back to come back to that, David. Let's go to you and share with us a little bit about your project. You, we let you get away with selecting something outside of uh, outside of donors choose, and you can tell us why. Okay, well we, we are. Uh involved in an interesting project here in Port Townsend. For those of you that don't know Port Townsend, we are uh, on the tip of the Olympic Peninsula. We're right out on the uh, Straits of Juan de Fuca. We're the wooden boat building capital of the Western world, maybe the whole world. Um, so we're a place where geography is really compressed. We have glaciers within 20 miles of this little seaport. And we are, are raising money in the community as venture capital to redesign our district to be built around the place we are in, so it's a place-based learning project. Um, we're raising the money locally, and then we're going regionally. Uh, we have a, a website up that's helping us do that, but so far our, our community has contributed over 25% of our goal to this project, and uh, we're going to begin with the work of redesigning our entire curriculum um, in the next few years. So the Maritime Discovery Schools Initiative is what it's called. Um, it's a fantastic community-based um, vision for learning in this community, and we're really excited about where it's taking us. It's uh, definitely a big stretch for this little town, but, but we're excited about the model and, and what it could be for other small districts around the world that, that want to really capitalize on their local identity and resources in the truest sense of the word. Perfect. Thank you for that, David. I know portable computing is a, a key, mobile computing is a key component of that as well. And uh, and I know uh, uh, our organization, Educational Systemics, is going to provide additional support there. So we um, really appreciate your leadership in that in that initiative. Um, last, let's turn to Eileen. Eileen, you selected 21st Century Technology and Special Ed. I did. And uh, sort of framing the way Elliot did about thinking about being at the edge, uh, philosophically, I'm a big believer in school. One of the functions of school is a socializing institution, and it's really important for a thriving society to have access and education for all. And so this group of children tend to be at the edge of our society. And when you think about universal design for learning and the learnings we get from that, I think it's a pay-it-forward model. When we support these children at the edge and they become strong functioning members of society, the learnings for the technologies we create for them are good for all children to learn. 
So I, I see this in particular as a pay-it-forward opportunity to uh, help society as a whole uh, create access for everybody. Well, that's that's great. And wh- where was that where where was that site located? That's actually local in a very uh, near me in a very low yeah. uh, a, a high poverty I should say area uh, school. And so uh, they also have a disproportionate number of children requiring special ed uh, services. So uh, yeah. I, I went for the sort of local global mix there. Perfect. Um, for those who are listening to the show, if you're not aware of Donors Choose, um, we're real believers in uh, really uh, helping educators who are trying to be innovative, really trying to address the needs of their students. And so we recommend going to Donors Choose. There is an Ed Table Talk page there where you can see the projects that our guests have selected and feel free to support those or any of the other programs that are that are on that site. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to, to let us know. We'll be happy to, to send you information for that. It's also available on the Ed Table Talk site. Um, if you have any questions for our guests, please go to hashtag E-T-T-F-E-B. Um, and you can uh, send that information there. So let's jump back into our conversation. I want to, I want to take us actually to where you were going, Elliot, around sort of that whole maker, hands-on sort of make it happen kind of mentality. And I'd love a discussion around sort of, you know, if you're using the technology, is it about driving kids through a curriculum, or how much of that's exploratory, and how well prepared are we? How well prepared are our teachers, our students, our schools, our administrators to take on that kind of challenge and change? Well, I think that the common core and that kind of mentality is going to push us away from the maker bot. It's going to push us to this is the content that needs to be managed and acquired, and this this move to personalized learning is really all about just getting the content down the kids' throats, and it's the opposite of the maker bot. So I think that's why I chose the maker bot. To, and I, you know, and just like Eileen, cho- cho- choosing the the special needs, you you want to show that there's another way. But I'm 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 not optimistic about what's about to happen in American education. Sorry. Oh, so, that, Elliot, piling on the maker movement, uh, Intel is a big supporter of the Maker Fair, and uh, uh, recently, you know, we've had uh, our new CEO very, very committed to the, the maker movement, and so on several levels, we are pivoting to address the maker movement. Uh, and, and robustly because we are looking at innovation going forward and people that are able to innovate. So very important uh, for the nation as well. To Elliot's point, you know, directionally, it, it's a good movement for us as a country. So, so Elliot, 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 let, let me give you a report from the edge. Um, we, mm-hmm. Our kids really do have a sense that we're at the edge of the world. Um, we're just a few miles away from Cape Flattery, which is actually the edge of North America uh, for our kids. So one of the, my students came to me with an idea to uh, develop a crab pot application, and, and you're wondering, well, what's that got to do with Makerspace? Well, we've got a pretty robust robotics program going here, and a student came to me and said, you know, Dr. Ring, we have uh, people with crab pots just offshore, and I have an application that will notify them when their crab pot is full, and they can paddle out and pull the crab pot out of the water. And he described to me how he came up with this uh, device that goes on the crab pot, how it signals the cell phone and feeds the application. And and so when I said that that these kind of developments are idiosyncratic, that's very Textual to our neighborhood, it's also applicable globally. I mean, that's a great little application he's designed. And it's also driving this um, educational model that says, think, solve local problems, build the technology to get us to that solution. And, and it creates a whole different um, school system, I think, if we capitalize on that. Yeah. So, so could this kid have done that without technology? I mean, wh- where does the one-to-one fit into that, David? Is it a, is it about the technology? Is it about the, I mean, the fact that a student could come to you and with that kind of, where does that tie to the curriculum? You know, I mean, where, I mean, how how does that fit with Common Core and and the kinds of requirements that we're seeing 
in the U.S. You know that what I'm I am worried I have the same worries that Elliot has about uh, yeah driving education in a direction that's probably too um, uniform. But what, where this came from, this student was out of a science class that has a lot of technology that has a, a resident robotics uh, makerspace in their classroom where we've uh, moved a lot of technology into that classroom and said think about local um, opportunities and invent things that have to do with science, technology, your local community, and a way forward. And, and so it's really a, a lab that is a lab. Schools need Anybody? those kinds of labs. Schools need those kinds, that kind of lab, right, so the kids can, can build things. So the technology is actually critical, right, to the, the, with the hardware and the software. And so maybe one-to-one -one is really an idea of 2009, 2008, and we are really past that at this stage of the game. Yeah, I think our, our, these children that I teach now are thoroughly uh, – immersed in the digital domain, I mean, in ways that most adults over 40 can't imagine. And so Absolutely. for them, that, that transition <laughs> to thinking in terms of the technology that needs to be applied here is just absolutely native. And, and I, it always surprises me because I'm a geezer, but um, that's who they are. <laughs> well, and it really changes if you think how we think about education, period, right? Because some of these kids may be our traditional trajectory into higher ed, what, what they would do with that, what's meaningful for them, given the opportunities of the modern world we live in, uh, and preparing them for alternative life journeys. Well, in fact, we may lose a lot of those kids if it weren't for these alternatives. And we have historically. Yeah. Um, and continue in many places to lose them. Um, and, and I, you know, in many cases they find their way, but it's often quite circuitous and around the systems that we provide instead of within the systems. I, I, I just want to get your reflection on um, if we think about the technologies that we use as tools that help us manage accountability um, and having students play an active role in their learning, documenting what they're doing, tying it back to the things that they're being held accountable for, that can be a very freeing kind of strategy to say, I've addressed all the standards for which me, my school, my, ed, my teacher are held accountable, but I've done so in a way that may be very non-traditional. Does that, does, that, uh, does that make sense to any of you? Does that, does that fit as a model? It, it, yes, I think it also is modeling metacognition the sort of reflective behavior uh, that's not necessarily convergent but embraces divergent thinking as well. And if you think about real innovation and breakthroughs and second-order change, it is that kind of thinking we need to engender to break through. And, and I think it ties back to where Elliot started with that and, and, then, and then David piled on about this space to experiment. So... Uh, you know, what's uh, clear to me then is students need to be much more conversant about uh, the standards in terms of how they understand them and how uh, they can work to kind of accommodate that, that constraining, and not necessarily constraining, but the, the boundaries of that. And, you know, I was thinking about in, in Port Townsend, we have a real culture here of craftsmanship, of, mm -hmm. of taking pride in the quality of your work. And I often wonder how that works in a standards-driven environment, and I'd love to hear some other thoughts about that. What do you think, Elliot? Well, I'm, the idea of craftsmanship is in some sense antithetical to how we're, the way we're pushing now. I think this issue of creating an entrepreneurship um, is really the critical piece, and it is we finally have uh, in the hands of all the kids they can make things, right? And where before it was much more difficult. I mean, the OLPC model was, oh, give the kids the computers and then they can make something, right? And they don't need curriculum. And in some sense, that, 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 that missed the mark also because they forgot about school. And you can't do that. You must remember school. But, but the idea that you have creativity and you can build things, that really did hit the mark. 
So you need the yin and the yang. You need the both. You need to be attentive to the curriculum, but that curriculum has got to be one where you create. And that, that model, of, I'm, I'm sure David's school district is like that. And when Eileen works with the schools, trying to make schools like that, and that's what we're trying to do in, in Nanshao in, 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 in Singapore, but it's difficult. Boy, it's difficult. So, but let's, and, let's and bring this back to one to one. Go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, I think what frustrates us is we do see oasis of this kind of activity happening. It's just not the norm. And, and right. the gap between where this is happening and the schools we really need to bring up in terms of their performance, it, that's quite a large gap. Yeah, and uh, I think, you know... It's a very striking gap, I think. Yes. Yeah. We all know, uh, you know, Karen Cater, who uh, has been a, a guest on this show, um, and the work that's being done over at Digital Promise. And I think to your point, Eileen, I mean, there we need to really look at those areas where innovation is happening and understand how we can, uh, you know, how we can replicate that in our own ways in, in local communities because um, it's so easy to point to where it's not working. That's easy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, one-to-one and maker, I mean, just want to make sure, what, what do we think the, the – what role does the technology play? If every kid has a, has a computer um, – does it dictate whether there's autonomy or, I mean, what does the one-to-one do for us? I think it depends, right? I've been in two jurisdictions where they have uh, one-to-one. And uh, what you see is very expensive pencils. They're doing exactly what they were doing before. It looks the same, except every kid has a device. And then on the other end, I've been places like Bergen Academy, where they're doing wonderful projects and just really the, the usages, and they mix it up. They're using the right tools for the, the challenge the kids are approaching. So I think sort of looping back to where David talked about understanding the learning vision. If your vision was more status quo, then, then the first model I discussed could be successful. If your vision is transformative, and, and more in the maker space, that, that's quite a different outcome. So I think Very success good. being good. locally defined depends on how you define success. Yep. Thanks for that. <laughs> Absolutely. And the problem is that a lot of the superintendents and principals don't really understand what opportunities are available with technology. And it's not surprising. That's just not their world. Their world's a different world. And so how do they, as leaders, educational leaders of their communities, really come to grips to understand what the opportunity is at hand and then take advantage of that? That's really a challenge. Yeah, that's yeah, really I think, um, exactly the project ahead, we're embarked on, is how to create a more uh, inventive environment for students to um, grow up in it. And so inventions just part of the culture as we grow up here and creating those spaces and reconceptualizing everything. Actually, the adults are the primary limitation in all of this work from my perspective, <laughs> myself and that. Yeah. yeah, and that's always the issue is how do you communicate to the community so that they're engaged and the expectation is, you know, I mean, I've, I, I have friends who are professionals where, you know, they tell me their kids can't work on the computer until they're done with their homework. <laughs> That's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, resetting and, and re-educating about that. Let me give each of you a chance to just give a uh, just a, a little short thought. We're gonna You're going to make a recommendation at the end of the show, but just some last summative kind of thought, and then we're going to go into our segment about conferences. Well, to start then, one suggested, uh, building on everything that everyone said is, what is your goal? What is it that you think you want out of the technology, and what is it that you think you want out of the kids when you, after you've done your innovation, what is it that you will get at the end? Make that clear. That's step one. Uh, Great. Uh, I'm in such violent agreement with Elliot's recommendation. You've got to <laughs> define what look like. <laughs> And and once you define what success looks like, a lot of the other decisions fall into place because they're in support of 
a consensus vision. It, and then yeah, I, iterate as you go along. One of the things I did uh, early on in my tenure here in Port Townsend is I had the community define how is a Port Townsend graduate different than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And once we had a definition of our graduate, said, let's create the conditions where that graduate could uh, organically appear as part of their experience of education here. And the other thing I told people is we're going to take risks. We're going to take a few leaps here. And um, that's important. I think that the educational systems are risk averse. They'll fail in the face of that. So I think huge. Uh, David, that's really amazing. It's really, really wonderful that you put that on the table. You're taking a risk. Some things will fail. And when you do research, when you do new things, when you explore, you will fail. You have to fail. It's I mean, part of the process. It's, it's part of the process. And, but yeah. you're right. In schools, nobody wants to be in the class, quote, that failed. But it, it's, it's not failure, but what you learn. Boy, that's a different kind of culture in a school. I, I think what people forget, Elliot, is that just standing still and not making change is another form of failure. They think yeah. by standing yeah. still and not innovating, not trying new things, that they're that they're not taking risk. Well, in fact, it's probably right. larger risk. So it's a, it right. is a cultural issue. Yeah. And so you know, I think just in summary, I think what we're hearing is one to one, not, like many other innovations, um, requires a very different kind of uh, you know, system in terms of the expectations and how it runs and risk taking and and uh, the the culture is one of continuous learning. Um, and I think physicians sometimes get it right when they call what they have a practice. Um, uh, you know, physician says, "Well, everything shows this should work. Let's give it a shot." Um, you know, the expectation is that teachers will know exactly what's right for every student. Well, in fact, it's a practice just the same. And, uh, and they need to be given the opportunity to innovate. So let's go ahead and turn to uh, some of the conferences. Um, as many of you know who listen in regularly, we have a segment where we talk about some of the conferences coming up in the next few months um, so that uh, you, you can know a little bit about those. The first one I'm going to start out, actually, is South by Southwest EDU, held, of course, in Austin, Texas. And uh, it's actually March 3rd through 6th. And uh, if you get a chance to go, it is well worth the opportunity. Uh, lots of good innovative discussions about, uh, about uh, a variety of different educational strategies and implementations, and um, certainly some discussions uh, focus on technology. There in the past there have been some announcements of products there, but a really different energy to that, uh, to that conference than at many others, um, partially because of its association with the other South by Southwest conferences. Um, Ron Reed does a great job there on that conference and pulling together a good group. And, uh, and uh, I presented last year and will present again this year actually on the Learning Resource Metadata Initiative as part of a workshop. So again, that's in Austin, March 3rd through 6th. Um, highly recommended if you're looking for something just a bit different. So, David, let's go to you next around NC, NCCE. Okay, well, that stands for the Northwest Council for Computer Education. It's a really nice mix of teachers, practitioners, uh, administrators, and experts in the field who come together. Uh, this year they're coming together in Seattle, and they'll be there in uh, March 12th through 14th. It's the largest uh, ed tech conference in the Northwest. It's, it's, I always like the, the teacher vibe to it. It's a great place to send lead teachers or early adopters or people that are inventive and looking for the tool set to, to imagine the future. And, and so it's always a real intensive and a, a great experience for teachers, and, and I'm going to send a team there. Um, typically, I go every other year because I just can't process that much from year to year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little bit more intimate than ISTE, um, yes. and uh, and a good team. Um, let's go to you next, Elliot. You had mentioned a conference in Maine, but you were very vague. Can you tell us about what this <laughs> is? <laughs> <laughs> well, Maine was the start of one-to-one -one laptops, right? They they said that uh, they, every kid was going to get one, and they did it in Maine. Uh, they did uh, Max at the time, and uh, on March twentieth, 
at Colby College. They're holding a, a conference that Kathy and I are giving a keynote and really just hosting a conversation, a day-long conversation to review what's happened and where Maine will be going. And so I think those in the, the Maine, Colby, Maine area um, might have a, a very interesting day to, to reflect on where Maine has been and where Maine is going. The, uh, some states, for example, are finding they have surpluses. Amazing, amazing. Well, should they use those surpluses? Because that's exactly what happened in Maine. They had a surplus. They used it. They bought one-to-one. Then the surplus evaporated, of course. But perhaps now, with the, the lower costs of the devices, some states might consider, again, uh, a device initiative. And we know, we know what's going to happen if they don't do it the right way. <laughs> <laughs> well, good, and we'll we'll post some information on our site as soon as you get that to us, uh, Elliot. Yes. Um, sure. So people can find that at uh, at edtabletalk.org. Um, uh, Eileen, tell us about this uh, Microsoft World Forum in Barcelona. Sure. Uh, and uh, when I was talking with you, uh, and and we were looking at uh, the the seg the conferences we were offering up here, I thought it would be nice to get a little international in the mix here. So uh, Microsoft is coming up very quickly here, and uh, most folks probably know that BET just happened in January in London, but BET tends to be more of a trade show. Uh, this is more of a conference, a conclave-like atmosphere where people are having a conversation about modernizing education. So, uh, and it does give you a, a, a look into how other countries, other geos are approaching the challenge of modernizing education. So uh, I thought I would share this opportunity as, as a way to think more broadly beyond the U.S. Perfect. And um, anything in particular to expect from that uh, if I attended? Oh, I think you'll see uh, lots of new devices and, and also very interesting usages uh, also happening in other countries that you might not see here. Perfect. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. I'll, I'll, I'll end on one, and I won't say much, because we'll certainly talk about it in our next show, um, and that is that we have two conferences coming up, one from the SIIA, that's the Education Industry Summit, um, and that's on May 12th through 14th. Um, our very own educational systemics, Tila Evans, is on the uh, local uh, on the arrangements committee for that, and uh, I know they're pulling together an exciting program. Educational systemics supports the one-to-one -one business connections there, and that's a great conference. I know we'll talk more. The other one is a conference that I chair, which happens in early June, which is the Content and Context Conference, um, put on by the Association of American Publishers. Again, a good set of tracks, and you'll hear plenty about that from me in the future. But plan on. Both of those conferences, uh, SIA May 12th through the 14th, and uh, and the uh, CIC AAP conference is the second through the fourth of June uh, in DC. So let's go back now to you can't handle the truth. Now we get to have fun and discuss these um, a little bit. We had three different rumors. We had the one-to-one -one twist that Eileen read. Um, talking about the Waldorf School near Silicon Valley. We had Elliot, who read about um, uh, the teacher in uh, Clovis, New Mexico, who uh, had gathered a whole variety of different kinds of technologies, not just digital. Um, and uh, David, who read about uh, looking at, at teacher uh, uh, perception of technology in both the U.S. and in Saudi Arabia. So between the three of you, which one do you think is the real rumor? Or give us some thoughts. Well, I want to hire the teacher in uh, Clovis. So, Elliot, can you send me his contact information? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's the true, the, the, the accurate one. I mean, you could see it. You could absolutely see a teacher taking on the, the initiative and bringing all kinds of stuff. I mean, that's, again, the MakerBot model. Bring the stuff in. Let's, let's go do it. Yep, yep. I could totally yeah. see that happening. I, is that the one you're going to choose as well? Everybody's settled on. Sometimes you get more than you pay for. Elliot's? Yep. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you'll be happy to know that our listening audience agrees with you. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, so apparently that is, however, not the truth. The real one <laughs> is... <Darn. laughs> 
<laughs> the real one is Ready or Not, the one that David Engel read. Um, it was actually a master's thesis by a student at Michigan State University um, from last year, just in, uh, I think it was June or, or May of uh, 2013. I'll be happy to post that reference. Um, I'll tell you, it was a rough one to summarize, but uh, uh, the other two, um, I think, uh, it certainly have things to teach us, and I always enjoy pulling these together. So thank you so much for reading those, and thank you so much for choosing the wrong one. <laughs> yeah, it's our pleasure. <laughs> yeah, good. Well, I do, um, you know, <laughs> it's always a lot of fun with those. So, yeah, I, I want to find that teacher, too, by the way. Um, I think that would be great. So uh, I do want to thank our guests um, uh, in terms of uh, their efforts and, you know, all of their, both of the, uh, all three of them have, you know, long histories working with one-to-one. -one. And what you can hear, we could have certainly found a less enlightened group who just talked about the technology, but I think this group really has a much broader um, and systemic perspective about uh, about education as a whole, and particularly around technology implementation. So I do want to thank all three of you for uh, your thoughts and feedback and, and hope our listeners uh, got something. I'm sure they did get something out of this. I hope that uh, we will continue the conversation about how to uh, implement one-to-one -one and the role that technology plays in our schools. So thank you so much for that. We're going to come back to you at the very end just to get uh, – uh, a piece of advice that you would give a school district who's looking to invest in a one-to-one -one program. Um, I do want to say that uh, Education Table Talk is a, is a production of Educational Systemics, and we do thank our sponsor, and uh, that is MCH uh, Strategic Data. They're a great group to work with, as I've mentioned before, and they're very supportive of our efforts here. Um, I do also want to offer, um, uh, we're going to be having a live Education Table Talk uh, meetings at various events. So hopefully you'll join us for dinner sometime, um, and we'll get together and have some informal table talks. Our next show is actually March 19th um, at uh, at the usual time, and uh, at that one we'll be talking um, we'll be talking about um, what do we have on the agenda? We're looking here. Sorry the March event. I have April's in my head. Oh, here we go. Addressing the needs of every learner, um, putting the U in personalized, and we're sp spelling personalized, P-U-R-S-O-N-L-I-Z-E-D. So um, looking at personalized learning, um, on that show we have confirmed uh, Steve Nordmark, and we have two others who are looking. Steve was just active in a, a technology and personalized learning conference held at the Friday Institute. Um, I know they were highly productive because they were all stuck in Raleigh, North Carolina together during one of the big storms. So uh, I think there's some interesting work there. So um, let's go ahead and finish out uh, with uh, what piece of advice would you give a school district who's looking to invest in a one-to-one -one program? Let's start with you, Eileen. Sure. Uh, uh, I would suggest uh, we have a blueprint uh, that we've tried in many locations, and it really resonates with what I heard from my colleagues today. Start with what would success look like? What would that learner look like? What does the learner need to do? And then, then you reverse engineer from there. And I think if you put that learner first and their needs first, um, in general, the outcomes will be more positive. Elliot, thank you, Eileen. Uh, I'd like to go back to something actually Eileen said earlier. The idea of pairing up teachers, I think a, a pilot project has to be done so that you get a, a sense of what you're, you're going to do and you're going to scale. But you've got to build a little mini community of teachers to do that pilot. So start a pilot, but get them two, three, four teachers together, and together they implement, not just one. David. Well, I'm left with, uh, I guess I'll, I'll stick with the soft skills. Um, I think you need to create a culture where uh, fun, there's a sense of fun, there's some joy in invention, and, and uh, openness to be surprised. So um, this, this is unpredictable territory, um, and it needs to have learners that are open to, to the joy of that. Perfect. 
Well, I do want to thank all three of our guests for a great show this week. Thank you for all of you that listened. Again, this is Education Table Talk, sponsored by MCH Strategic Data. Um, thank you all. hope you have a really productive coming month. Um, let us know if you have any topics you want to address, and we look forward to having you back at the table next month. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. -bye.